Why? My friend James is a bike fitter with over 20 years of experience. In today's episode, we're gonna go through 10 more things that he hates. Long reach handlebars, made worse in this case by abysmal control location. Nice one, Halfords. So when I'm talking about reach, we're talking about this metric here. It's the distance between the center of the handlebar ball and where the control is located. This particular example is also an anatomic shape. 2001 called it wants its handlebars back, uh, which basically means that you can only put your hands here or here. There isn't really any in-between point. The problem with this type of handlebar, in my opinion, is that it adds or can add quite a lot of unnecessary reach to the front of the bike, meaning that the reach of the controls is made more difficult and typically resulting in hand issues, neck and shoulder issues, saddle issues. Replace it with something like a Data RHM or a Zip Short Reach or a Specialized Short Reach and you'll lop off a lot of reach from the front of the bike, negating a lot of these discomforts. Bars that might be worth avoiding are uh, anything that's got an anatomic shape. Sorry, Trek, but the, the VCLS handlebar uh, shape, which is actually quite a nice handlebar shape, but does have an incredibly long reach. Most products from 3T. It's also worth noting with reach that when you look at bar geometry on websites, I'm not sure that uh, these manufacturers are, are being consistent with their measuring because we've seen handlebars that are supposedly 75 millimeters in the reach, don't know how they're measuring them because they come up a lot longer than the known 75 millimeters of a Data RHM. So just be cautious with handlebars. Brooks Leather Saddles. This is potentially an unpopular one with many of you. The concept is not a new one. It was thought up hundreds of years ago. The, the hammock design of a Brooks saddle, although very, very comfortable, doesn't really offer anything in the way of support. As a result, it tends to transfer a lot of that weight and lack of stability into the front of the bike. Most people using Brooks style leather, sorry, Brooks leather style saddles, particularly on a road bike, are typically predisposed to having neck, shoulder issues, hand issues as well. It's worth noting that for short distances and in some cases on more traditional kind of touring orientated bikes, they might not cause quite so many issues, particularly if the handlebar and the saddle are more level, but certainly in a road bike scenario, I would try and steer clear of them. One and a quarter inch steerers. Although technically this is better and it's been, it's been adopted by the likes of Giant and Canyon for their front ends, uh, it does afford you technically lighter weight and more stability. However, it brings with it a litany of uh, incompatibility issues, namely for stems and cockpits. So there, there are only two or three brands that offer one and a quarter inch st uh, steered stems and furthermore there isn't a great deal of, of range in terms of length so it, it just frankly it causes problems and the industry isn't quite there yet it's too soon just stick with one and eight it works best it works just fine i question whether you even need to have it that light and that stiff the specialized ethos <sighs> this is one of my ha most hated products because it flat out frustrates the hell out of me this was a bike that was designed for the people. It has all of the makings of the perfect bike. It's light, it's stiff, it's functional, it's easy to use. It's got uh, external cable routing, for instance, rather than it having, all it having it all integrated inside of the cockpit, which I know is very trendy, but it's a mechanical nightmare. However, the geometry is exactly the same as a Tarmac SL7. Why? It's too long and it's too low, it doesn't fit many, most consumers, and it's just frankly not fit for purpose. It's stupid. It's a bike for the people that doesn't fit the people. It fits pros who are not normal people, the freaks. Sorry, boys. Can somebody please just make? I mean, so so if they if they take if they use the Athos if they design the Athos around Roubaix geometry, then it would be literally the perfect consumer bike because it would be a bike that was light, stiff, and fun and agile to ride, but also fits well as well, right? And, and also wasn't you know wasn't sluggish and heavy because of all the suspension gadgets and gizmos. Can somebody please just make a bike like this? This is why I, I sell so many custom bikes because we build bikes that are light, agile but they fit as well. Stop what you're doing. We're interrupting your normal scheduled programming to tell you about a brand new podcast, which we're doing right now. The Wild Ones podcast. What's the Wild Ones podcast? So in the latest episode, we are talking about cab going into retirement, why the cycling industry is in turmoil, why pro bikes are a lie, and asking why are we all so obsessed with bike weight? Pro bikes are a lie. Well, we're about to find out. 
Head over to our YouTube channel. There's a podcast section where it's on there. You'll also find us on Spotify or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. We will be there. The Wild Ones Podcast. Boom. Sorry, Specialized, you're getting it from me again. Specialized shoes. The bigger problem here is the non-neutrality of a Specialized branded shoe. Something, this is something that nobody tells you and they do tell you they make it sound like it's a good thing. So Specialized has a built-in four-foot wedge. This is not a Specialized shoe. Uh, it has a built-in four-foot wedge in the front of the shoe. What that essentially means is that this is a left shoe. The medial side, the right side of it, is elevated. It's, it cants the foot like so. It's intended to treat what's known as a four foot varus deformity. Emphasis on the word deformity, which is what it's known in medical terms. In the cycling industry, it's thought of as commonplace. Uh, although in, in the last 500 bike fits, I've, obse I've observed two. What the four foot varus deformity refers to is a skeletally fixed elevation of the first line of bones. I mean, I know this is my hand, but uh, basically it's your, your big toe and all of the bones associated with it up. What that means is that it usually results in that first ray of uh, bones being elevated. And without sufficient support, uh, it results in excessive pronation of the ankle joint. The problem being here that most people don't possess this, it's, it's relatively uncommon. So what we tend to find with, uh, with a specialized brand of shoes is it's a, it's applying uh, support where it's not warranted nor needed. What that typically results in is supination of the foot or, or just applying a, a, a additional or excessive pressure through the ball of the foot. Q, foot problems, ankle problems, knee problems, and quite often saddle issues as well. By neutralizing it, i.e. by putting a four foot wedge inside the shoe reversed, then a lot of these problems can go away. However, that starts to encroach on the uh, the space that's inside of the shoe. What we tend to find ourselves doing is actually removing the shoe from the equation altogether, and more often than not, the problems disappear. Uh, it, I'm not saying that these shoes necessarily cause these problems. There are, however, correlations between the use of these shoes and the problems that we've associated. It's just something to be aware of, that it is a non-neutral shoe. The oversimplification of stack and reach. So to be clear, stack and reach are two metrics uh, quite often found in geometry tables on bike manufacturer websites. They refer to the vertical and horizontal distances of the center of the head tube to the bottom bracket, right? Essentially, they are the front end coordinates of the bicycle. And they're typically used to dictate optimum size of bike. It's a bit too simple. There's not enough that, it doesn't take into consideration a number of other parameters. For example, the seat tube angle of a bike will influence the overall reach to the handlebars. The stem length will also influence the overall reach to the handlebars, as will the handlebar rotation, the control location, the handlebar type. Even the shifters themselves will influence the reach of a bike. So, and this is kind of my problem with the whole stack and reach concept, is that it's a good starting point, but it's just, it's been massively, radically oversimplified. Bike fitting, unfortunately, is quite complex. It's why I have a job. We find stack excessive or insufficient stack causing less problems than excessive reach. Stack can be massively influenced by applying headset spaces. Something also worth considering is that bottom bracket drop, i.e. if the bottom bracket is dropped below the line of the wheel um, axles, you increase the stack without necessarily increasing head tube length. So it's worth noting that head tube length itself is not a, an exact representation of how high a front end, uh, the front end of a bike is. This is kind of why stack and reach even exists. My gripe is not with stack and reach, my gripe is the uh, the oversimplification of it and how and, and how it's used. Integrated suspension systems in road bikes. <sighs> this is something that we found from uh, the likes of Trek and Specialized. They are using now using sort of suspension systems in the front end, but also decouplers as well to isolate the rider from vibrations uh, in the road. Now it's all well and good using it for Paris Roubaix. The vast majority of people who are buying these products aren't riding in Paris Roubaix. And furthermore, what they typically result in is increased weight, added complexity, and what we found come to find more often than not is they start to creak. Uh, I just personally don't see the point in these systems. Use larger tire volumes, run at lower pressures is gonna offer you loads more compliance, particularly when comparing to an era where we only had like 23 millimeter tires that were pumped up to 130 PSI. It's, it, I just don't see a great deal of need for it. And as a result, you, start, you, you will see that these bikes are massively inflated in their cost. Everything now is getting more expensive, even more so when you're starting to introduce unnecessary, heavy, expensive suspension systems. 
The Shimano 2300 shifter. Recently reborn as the Tawny shifter. I thought these had died, but unfortunately that's not the case. This is an eight speed shifter, which has some say a Campag like thumb shifter at the top here. There's a difference. With Campag shifter, you can use the thumb shifter on the drops. With this one, you can't, unless you've got thumbs like Edward Scissorhands. They are shit. Although these newer ones do have reach adjustment, they aren't functional when, when in the drop. It's just something that, frankly, I thought had died. It should have died a long time ago. And there are much, much better alternatives to this system. The 2300 shifter was historically replaced by the Claris lever, uh, or the Claris transmission, which is an eight speed, much more functional and much more ergonomic uh, shifter that draws design uh, cues from the higher end transmissions, you know, namely Tiagra 105, Altegra and Ace. It has a functional downshift button, which you can use on the drops, still has the, the, the reach adjustment, but fundamentally, it's just a much more functional system. This, tra this, cla this Claris transmission can be found on bikes as cheap as how much is this Carrera? 430 quid for this bike uh, with, with this transmission on it. And, and there are other alternatives from non Shimano brands, namely Micro Shift. Again, has all of the added functionality from, from the drop. Uh, I, in, this, in this case, it's, it comes with a rigid brake lever and you've got uh, two, two different buttons. Uh, again, eight speed functionality. This one doesn't have any reach adjustment, but frankly, reach adjustment is less of a problem if your handlebar width's optimized. So there you go. There are alternatives to the crappy tawny lever Stick with either the micro shift, or if you can push to push your budget to the Claris, go with that one instead. In my opinion, that is the better one. The Claris is the better one. Flat bars on a gravel bike. Geometrically, gravel bikes derive from road bikes. As a result, they typically place a little bit more weight through the front of the bicycle. So there are a number of ergonomic complexities, sorry, there are a number of ergonomic issues associated with using a, a, a flat handlebar on, on a gravel bike. Um, typically, it results in can, can result in wrist drop, uh, which leads to typically complications with the ulnar nerve, uh, cue, numb hands or pins and needles or even wrist pain. But that typically resonates up through the neck and the shoulder. Ergonomically, a drop handlebar is simply better. Now, there are some of you out there who are probably thinking, well, a flat handlebar affords me more control. Well, again, it's a gravel bike, it's not a mountain bike. So if you're using or needing more control, I would suggest you're probably using the wrong bike. Flat bar on, on a mountain bike makes perfect sense, does offer you more control, typically due to the more dynamic nature of riding a mountain bike. You know, you're going through berms and jumps and roots and rots and whatnot. Whereas a gravel bike is typically designed to be ridden on slightly smoother, less technical terrain. If you're using, if you're needing more control, then I would probably consider the bike usage. The misleading nature of sizing structures within bicycles. My, my gripe with this is that uh, the two don't seem to correlate. Like a medium sized bike is usually too large for a medium sized human being. Francis and I are both, we're, we're 5'9", five, 5'10", five, and we would both ride a small sized bike, 52, 53 centimeter. And it, you know, logic dictates that if, you know, we're, we're both medium sized people, I would say. And so, you know, if you go and buy a t-shirt in a shop, you probably, I would normally buy a medium. So logic dictates that I would buy a medium bicycle. If I look at like a medium, basically medium anything from major bike brands, they're talking 55 centimeter top tubes, which is just way too long for me. Uh, so I, I feel that there needs to be a bit of a shift in terms of how we're sizing bikes, but I think mostly consumers need to look at more than just the size. You need to understand how to read geometry tables. Particularly, I mean, look look at things like Stack and Reach. We talked earlier in this video about the simplification of Stack and Reach, but also look at uh, the top tube length. Have a look at the seat tube angle. The, with the seat tube angle, the bigger the number, the, the shorter the bike is going to be essentially, because the steeper the seat angle, the, 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 the bike's gonna be shorter. Uh, there are now some manufacturers that are namely Canyon and who else? We're talking about Triban have a component geometry table on their on their website, which gives you an outline as to handlebar widths and stem lengths. These things usually aren't commonplace on, on bike manufacturer websites. Like I say, there are some that are doing it. Thank you, Canyon. Thank you, Triban. All of these things will influence and contribute to your overall comfort on the bike. Pay more attention to other metrics beyond just the size of it, because the size itself can be very misleading. If you think about Pinarello, the way they size their bikes, they size their bikes based on the seat tube length. So a 50 centimeter Pinarello 
which many would say, okay, well, that's a quite really quite a small bike. It's got a 52 and a half centimeter top tube, which is almost long enough for me. My bike's to all 53s. So I, I think there needs to be more attention paid to other metrics within the geometry table rather than just small, medium, large, extra large. A, a rider's layout will, will typically dictate how long the bike needs to be. So if you've got someone who's got a long torso, they're gonna need a longer top tube. Short torso, short top tube. This is all the more reason to have a bike fit before you buy a bike so that you take out all, all of, you extrapolate all of the guesswork from the equation and you buy something that's specifically for you. That marks the end of today's video. Please put any questions you have in the comment section down below and I'm sure James will do his best to answer them. If you wanna book a fit with James or check out his shop, link is in that description. Thank you for watching and subscribe for more.